Welcome. This is a July 16th Jalen Zones production user call. We have Doug, Daniel, Jan, and myself, Michael, and we have lots on the agenda. Uh, let's talk 9PFS. I've been giving it a try. I filed a bug about the uh, page fault on shutdown, and it was rapidly fixed and rapidly committed. I'm delighted for that. I've linked that in the document. Um, let's see where to go. Let's go with a simple one. Doug, uh, I see that VI is not happy. It gives me an error about uh, a log file. I tried mounting tempfs, and unless my syntax is wrong, thought that would do the trick, but it didn't like tempfs. I don't know if it's a question of semantics. Did you load the kernel module? Uh, is the kernel module loadable right let, now? Because is it? I think, do you have a I think the mount also loads, loads, doesn't it? Uh, let's see. Kill these steps. Only when you have the kernel module in the kernel module path. Right. Uh, dev slash kernel. Is it not called tempfs.ko? We don't. KLD I mean... load dash n dash v uh, tempfs. It's it's in the VM, the 15 oh, VM. Oh, I see the problem. I did a, I'm working on an Occam BSC system. So suddenly I have a whole lot fewer resources. So my bad. Okay, so let's ignore that one. Uh, oops. But I will I will work my way outward with uh, dependency, with uh, infrastructure to do that. Oops. Uh, I mean I'm I'm speculating that it might be to do with um, tempfs because that was my workaround for getting some other things to work um, with a nine p root because the semantics for um, mapping file descriptors to. Um, the corresponding nine p fit thing. Oh, did you write? Uh, did you write the man messy. page? I did write the man page. Yeah, yeah, that was that was useful. That, thank you for that because I, <laughs> oh, I once I got uh, temp 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 and var temp uh, mounted as temp at best, then that fixes vi and everything else. Oh, it's in there. Fantastic. Oh, yes. yeah, excellent. Yeah, I think um, I had problems with what? dh client. But I'm not sure where they came from. Um, it wouldn't, one it wouldn't common work reason, on... yes, young, would be if you uh, lack a parent directory and the file system isn't writable, so that you can't create the parent directory for something. Yeah, I think some of the problems I had with nine p serving the slash temp were to do with privilege lowering. So, you know, some daemon starts with root privileges, does some setup and drops. And that that kind of broke things because um, it would try and create a new fit, wouldn't be able to because like the file's been removed or something. Um, yeah, so um, the workaround was just, just not do that on 9P and tempfs was my workaround. But tempfs under 9P technically. In the big picture. Well, yeah, mounted on the, the Go ahead, Dan. Is the uh, P server was smart enough to support things like uh, NFS does with keeping track of uh, logically deleted files, but okay. keeping them in the host file system? So, in yeah. if you look at the protocol itself, um, there is an, a, an open to close semantic. Loop. So you you call make a essentially an open call. It opens a file descriptor on the server and holds it. And you yeah. and then you you when you're done with it, you you close it with another RPC call. So um, the POSIX semantics for like open, unlink, and stuff should work. The problem is in the FreeBSD kernel, the VFS um, design doesn't allow doesn't support the, the state required to to use uh, to have that same open to close semantic. Um, so, I think it might be possible to hack it to do something like it. I mean, DevFS already does something kind of vaguely close to what I want, but I haven't tried to make it work. So your problem is the file ID to a file opening mapping? Yeah. So what, what happens is we'll... In the in the open call, the file descriptor, um, we call vop open in the in the um, fs that returns a v node, 
and that's all we've got. We're going to share that Vino across all possible file descriptors that might open that that file. Um, so underneath in 9P, we actually want to try and use uh, a, a FID instead of a, a Vino. We want multiple FIDs for, for different Vinos. And we kind of use a heuristic, which is keep a cache uh, indexed by UID, which is horrible. Um, but that's where privilege lowering kills us. Do you Is go the, through that caching mechanism for every operation in the VFS? Um, anything that's involving a FID, so any file I/O, basically. And you index by current thread. EUID? Yeah, it's, it's the current thread. Well, it's it's the the current process creds. Mm, okay, I see the problem. Because you can't have well, different I think threads I see some in the same the problems. problems with different UIDs. So yeah, it's a bit messy. So to to fix it, we kind of we have we need to be able to pass through. We need to be able to return from VOP open um, a cookie that we can then pass back into read and write calls. And we can use that to unambiguously get the correct fit. Mm. But yeah. it would be a bit disruptive to the VFS um, design. And at least now everything is in tree, but uh, yeah, yes. I mean, it so works well it... enough for most things, but it's it's kind of got it's sort of experimental. If it works for your use case, great. Um. um but you might you might come across some of its sharp edges. So, hmm. and you can't just uh, I don't know in the in the context you are. Do you have the pointer to just the V node or also to the file opening? You okay? So I need to read the code, but it, from memory, um, when I do a write system call, say it goes to. Um, the file descriptor, the file descriptor has an ops table that um, then directs to, oh, we're doing a, a write on a V node. So I think it's called VN underscore write or something like that. And then that calls the VOP write uh, yeah. in the file system. Uh, that's the point when we need to be able to store information in the file descriptor that came from the open and pass it back through write to close that loop. Um, and that's because the that's the gap. Hmm. Yeah, I'm getting that SMP safe uh, <laughs> and correct because uh, <clears throat> you can't just cheat and use the uh, pointer as a cookie or something. Um, the question is, which pointer? Because the problem is that in the invalidation of that if the pointer gets freed and potentially reallocated. Well, you think, you think the, the the pointer would have to be something that was allocated by the file, the VFS that was stored in the file descriptor and then handed back to close and freed during the bot close. Just a terrible, terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, scary. It's scary to, know, to think about uh, how to yeah, do that. Yeah. During open uh, of a file. Uh, could you basically embed the uh, UID it, who did reopen in the inode number and then mask that out uh, on start? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> oh, congratulations. Maybe. <laughs> Sorry for um, making it worse. <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, is that the UID is, is, the, is the whole problem. We can't. The the indexing by UID is is the is causes the problem with with wrong semantics for privilege lowering. We have to be able to if someone holds the what what happens on a real normal file system is someone opens a file has a file descriptor, and then holds that file descriptor open through the privilege lowering, and then they still have of course with that file descriptor they have the the privs that was associated with its mm -hmm. open. We need to be able to have that semantic 
which is why you need a cookie from the open and that we store that in the file descriptor. But a vnode is uniquely identified by file system ID and inode number, right? Yes. So, and the inode number in FreeBSD 14 is 64 bits. The user ID is 32 bits. The problem is that we need to use the, the user ID. Maybe this will work. So we're going to encode the, the user ID of the opener. In, yes. Oh. Embed that, that as a, so that you have a kind of a composite uh, primary key inside the 64 bit yeah. of uh, basically, I would say the, the file descriptor um, number of the file you opened or something yeah. or whatever. So you basically then, suggest it. I think what what I'm thinking is you're suggesting that, so we that, that you have different vnodes for each UID. We have different vnodes for each UID, right? Exactly. Oh. But you don't yeah. want uh, users to be able to tell that. So, if, mm. but if you have, but if uh, f start and start and read there are callbacks, and you can do special things and then forward or do mm. a generic one or uh, call the generic and then filter the result so that you can mask that out. Yeah, I think it might. The user space this. wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. And. Okay. It wouldn't be clean. <laughs> I'm sorry no. for bringing that up. No, no, no. It's it's a good idea. Um, I was sort of hoping that Vert, Vert IFS, which is based on Fuse, would just come along and solve all my problems. But maybe that well, might be boring. That's a question on the list. How close yeah. do we have the framework for that or not? Is it completely well, different? Think... Is it a different beast? Is it just a? It's basically it's is so. Uh, you you know of fuse the sure, user yeah. space, user file space. yep yep and there's some some sort of transport from the kernel to to user space to make fuse work ah okay yeah. um with vertio fs we use vert vertio as the transport so it's literally the fuse rpcs routed through the vertio into the host and um so basically use the free use protocol, which presumably has the right semantics for us. Ah, okay. Yes, but the problem is that you're kind of inverting the direction from the guest's point of view and the server's point because now suddenly the hypervisor yeah. is the fuse server. Well, and yes, although the, in there's practice, not a process in, in, on Linux, there's a, there's one at a time, one at a time. Space. There's, on brilliant. Linux, there's a user space daemon called vertiofsd or something like that um, that um, receives the the RPCs. However, that works. I haven't even looked at it. Mm, the Linux kernel uh, is able to spawn helper processes on its own for things. No, you have to you have to run this manually, as far as I can remember. Oh. Um, well, I say manually. System D does it or something. Um, but just to to um, Offer some hope. Not, wait, Warner, I, Warner I, told me that somebody had a Vertio FS implementation for FreeBSD. I have no idea who it was, where it is, or how what completion level it is, but it may or may not exist. Talk to Warner. Wait, if you're willing to accept the indirection through user space, the, yes, we already have a fuse kernel module. So what then would happen is that you spawn this process Hang on. and uh, it basically needs a dummy device to uh, have access to the vet AO queues and interrupts. Yeah, I guess and, that's how it works, but... Um... But it would be nicer to have that in the kernel because just of the context switching and the problem that this design isn't really suitable for using as a root file system. Because where would you spawn the yeah. helper from? Well, you know, for any any hope of it being um, a root file system, you have to. Oh dear, how would you how would this even work? You'd have to have to be able to hook up at boot time through Vert the Vertio um, queuing. I don't think that this this 
all, a lot of this complexity should be in in the um, guest. It should be in the hypervisor. So Beehive should should handle or or proxy out to some other daemon to 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 receive the RPC calls. Uh, you have would do your power virtualized I/O, uh, so it's another vid I/O device. But it we're totally well, off topic for uh, the JS yeah, call. Yeah. So <laughs> too much. yeah, yeah. Um, I re I remember I d I did do a speed read through the Linux implementation, and basically they virtualized the transport in their Fuse implementation, so it can be through the the traditional Fuse device or routed through Virtual. Uh, Daniel, that's the entire, of course, FreeBSD repo, but it has the bits of Vert IOFS hiding in it, so if one can. Uh, this down. is not the. This is not the Vert not IOFS that IOFS. I'm thinking of. This is the P. This is the nine P implementation. They should oh, not have called it Vert FS. Oh, this is a bad goodness. name. Because uh, well, there, there might even be a Vert. FS that is not vert IOFS because I renamed it to right. P9FS to yes, avoid this you. kind of confusion. Nope. Oh boy. Okay. Uh then one should reach out to Warner. That's there. I think it was one. I'm pretty sure it was one. Okay, cool. And he was very quick to pat, uh, apply that fix for the page fault yeah. on down. Cool. Um moving on. Uh Daniel and I were experimenting with this yesterday. Uh so is beehive load a hard requirement at this time to use root on 9pfs at this time yes we already well we wait we we i we already identified well, that that's not true well so well, okay tell tell us what you did daniel this was science from like okay. last yesterday and tonight uh, this morning Great. so <laughs> so and the, and, the, and and there's a there's a reason why it could be useful also but if you just have a you know, a tiny drive with a yeah, buy and, and slash boot, uh, right. maybe preferably with Etsy host ID, then, then you can do it. It works. Um, the the reason why I think that that's wouldn't you have that's to have the kernel in that funny file system because basically yeah, that's um, yeah, it's a thirty five uh, thirty five regs so. one at a time. Well, the the load loaded on FE has to be able to to read the the kernel file and the modules and so on so yeah if it was a if it was a uh, a really clean nice um route where the kernel and everything is is in the 9p then um the loader starts to have to know how to find the pci device and access vertio and then have a simple rpc 9p rpc client i mean it's all doable it's just going to be a bit hairy. Um, uh, well, I mean, it does it does work, but the um, yeah. I mean, if you can, are you saying kernel, what what I'm saying is to you, avoid having this extra file system to have everything oh, yeah. in a in a host directory shared with okay, so, so I have a related. That's a heavy way. Oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah hold that thought, uh, Jan. So, uh, Daniel, you have the floor. You ran some science. Let's see what your results are. Yeah. So one, so one of my science is if I don't have a 15, uh, if I don't have a FreeBSD 15 host, then beive load is going to, is going to, is going to bootstrap with the, with the hosts kernel, right? So if I want backward compatibility, then the EFI method is necessary anyway. Oh. Um, right. Cause because because that this this problem ha happens if you get a FreeBSD 14.1 VM and you boot it on uh, 13 with a Z with a um, then then on the second boot of that FreeBSD 14 uh, cloud uh, uh, VM image that you just immediately download it'll die because the host kernel doesn't know how to boot. Uh, ZFS and it automatically updates its its ZFS on, on the first boot. So, um, I, so there's I some there's so. some magic between Beehive. I mean, I'm sure it does. Mm. I, I filed the so bug I, report. I use Beehive I think... load with a with a dash h path, and then it loads kernel and modules and stuff from there. Um, um... Exactly. Oh, I don't know. So can, the problem is, is that in. you're pointing Beehive load 
uh, by default uh, slash boot, but yeah. you have to specify the directory um, uh, it should use. And I think the command line flag for that is H. H for host yeah. path. Yeah. So you point it at the host path and then it can read a, uh, the kernel and kernel modules from there. Yeah, because I've definitely so you either... run 15 um, VMs on a 13 and 14 host. So you the either need... Problem... So you either what... need a... So you either need a... Uh, I mean, then then you would still need the, the 15 kernel, though, on your, yeah, on your so system. I, I so put... we still need to I... have some extra junk. No, I put the 15 kernel and the modules and stuff in the 9p directory. The 9p... So yeah. 9p has a slash boot. And with all the stuff in it, and then Beehive load reads it from there. Um, that worked for me. Go ahead, Jan. Okay. Oh, I so see. Okay. I, an idea would be the following: hat. Um, hmm. you you could either use just a little read-only device and then reboot. But the problem is that now your kernel is external. But I think the boot ROM can be used to. Uh, uh, configure a RAM disk, hmm. a RAM disk at EFI level. So if you copy the, and use the the fake kernel to copy that in, and then did a soft reboot without destroying the VMM device, Do you we should still have Linux? your your guest RAM disk, and the EFI yeah. claims in the documentation that it's able to boot off that. Okay. That's very Linuxy. Totally <laughs> crazy. I've never tried it. It's just that I found it in their documentation. Hmm. Right. Don't know if it works, but that way you could basically use uh, a host provided kernel to uh, load the into a RAM disk and then reboot from that. Hmm. And that then would be the guest kernel, and it would just uh, then use. Uh, slash dot uh, and mount conf or uh, rerouting to mount the real file system via 9 PFS. It's quite a, a quite a backflip be to possible, say 35 it... megs. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, no. have, I have a question is what, why do we need UFE? I mean, what is it doing for us? I... It uh... decouples you from free beer. These specifics so that you can do more than just FreeBSD on FreeBSD. Yeah, and it also but, limits. But they're not going to surface in the context of root on nine p. They're not going to. They're not going to support that anyway. Well, you, you could do a Debian VM, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, um, I did it with Debian. Okay. Right. So I mean, interesting. Uh, um, I'm main... curious about how they how that works. I've never tried it. And there is a QEMU mm -hmm. page on root on 9P, but I, I forget what they're doing to load it. Right. Uh, Grub will take all sorts of parameters. That, that would be worth worth looking at, I suppose. Um, Although, then, I mean, I think that it's it's also the, the utilities, you know, I mean, obviously it's huge, but there, there are some limits because, I, I mean, I think that set UID doesn't work and sockets don't work. So, you know, there, there are going to be places where we need, you know, other, I'm, well, I don't know. I mean, there's, obviously it's a computer. You can do a billion different things with it, but um, yeah, we will bump up on, on some edges at certain places. So the main reason why I really detest Beehive load is the attack surface because it does all the bootloader stuff as a privileged process on mm -hmm. the host. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, my and... use case is, is me me just doing random kernel tests. So yeah. <laughs> that that's, but yeah. I know that there's point. been some work to cap the commise beehive load. I haven't checked if it's a true sandbox by now. And you could jail it, but that's... Uh... Um, a continuous topic. Ah, uh, yes, I could share that, but so, it's still it would need access to the to the directory that you're gonna um cast for the for the VM root. 
the dash H. Right. So there's no there's no pain and suffering in <laughs> adding the the same the same exact boot that you're going to use anyway. Well, right you know, um, you could yeah, have it, you sense. could have it inside a jail and then like nullfs mount the the directory so the it can attack its the 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 guest but not the host. Oh, I was going to ask that. Uh, it, proper I, capsicum, it can be, for example, configured to be read, open it read only. Uh, it can uh, lock itself in so that it can only use those file descriptors it already has. So capsicum mm -hmm. capability mode is a safe sandbox unless you have sure. an outside harper by design. So in theory, it can be safe to run untrusted code as root uh, what if you know the untrusted part is only hit once you're inside a safe Capsicum sandbox? So the Lua boot script that just does rm rf slash would be caught? Uh, it would be unable to do anything because it okay. would have a read execute file descriptor for a directory and um, yeah. If you have the directory, then nullfs mounted read only and so on, it's, it can't do anything to that. And Daniel, you used a Debian VM, is that right? And was that like... Oh, not for, oh. yeah, not for boot, not, not okay. for uh, root, root mounting, but... No. Okay, well, let me look up that page. Uh, QEMU root. Okay, well, I yeah, I just want to keep shedding light on this. It's an exciting new tool, even if it's only for developers, it's a really useful tool, it seems. I mean, I, I know that positive feedback's been there. And Doug, if it's already useful to what you're doing, then I mean that, it's that's it's that. super helpful for kernel development. It shortens the the modified test loop considerably. Yeah, and uh do everyone check out um uh uh uh, uh Rob I believe it's Nelson. Uh, Rob's talk from BSD can on quiz, which is his like uh, user command running a VM running ZFS in Linux. So he can just control C and move on and you know, make his change. It was uh, Norris, that's I believe it. Uh, Norris, note, yeah. Yes, note Rob Norris is. I, in the it's in the various docs, but it's this whole notion that we're just tearing down all these barriers and getting right to what we're working on. Uh, so there's that. Okay. Um, I see something about bugs that Jan you've posted. What do they relate to? Uh, these are bugs we've mentioned before in this call. It's the problem of um, passing directory file descriptors between. Uh, jails or parent and jail ah, okay where the root escape mechanism so that a jail can't just cd dot dot out of its root directory um, works by comparing the root v node against the nodes encountered on the path and if you start uh, going up the file system uh, from outside the jail route you will never hit the jail root directory along the path, so you can go all the way to the real root file system and then use your super user status to um, have unrestricted access to the host file system. Yay. Yay. Uh, it requires <laughs> a bit of special circumstances, but it's a totally reproducible uh, jail escape mechanism if you have that precondition ever satisfied. That and might be a question I for wanted... Vine in a sec, but let's uh, paint this picture. Uh, so Vine, take a look at those while we're doing this, but uh, you, you may recall him yes. from a week or two ago. Um, mm -hmm. I have a super quick question. I know that Windows uh, Weasel, WSL Windows subsystem for Linux was using 9P. Do we know if it's currently using it? I can't tell if it's started to or stopped I, or using a block device. I did a I did a little bit of research on this. Yep. It uses a WSLFS, which is which cool. is you know a similar fork as for IO FS. Okay, that so it's their that. own. Yeah. So if we if we wanted, uh, yeah, if we wanted the FreeBSD on Weasel, we'd probably have to. Yeah, we'd probably have to learn how to speak that too. Okay, FSL. Um, 
Yeah, I've been wondering because there's, the, there's very mixed information out there and apparently their distributions are way out of date, just saying. Um, and just broadly, uh, Doug, you mentioned the uh, sharp edges of 9P. I'd love to see a <laughs> Venn diagram of NFS and 9P, not a file system or, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, I remember trying the Zen air quotes database, which is a simple like Berkeley DB database. And it was really unhappy on NFS for what it's worth. Uh, are there, cool. So anyway, anything else on 9P at this point? And thank you for your notes there. And no, I guess you can't have UA5 bars that message in the, the directory to boot out of, but. Is, is set UID, uh, oh, actually, sorry. I have yeah, two please. questions, but I think they're lightning round. Yeah, please. Uh, number one, you, you can't cross file system boundaries, right? From your, for your uh, 9P share? I you can. Haven't tried, but I think it would work. Oh wow! Okay, I'll, I'll practice. Um, because it's okay, basically the, everything goes straight out to userland, and the userland will open. And if that that should should that that open should cross the the FS boundaries because of the way how uh, the nine PFS was implemented in Beehive's user space process, it would require extra code to make sure to break it in such a way that it does not go to some uh mount points because user space normally doesn't notice uh, when it crosses a mount point you really have to check the file system id of your current directory and your parent directory yeah. you could do uh, that you could definitely do that in lib 9p so nice. um Ooh. it would require I mean, more work not to support uh going into some file systems then it is no code to support it all right, my second lightning round question yes. uh, is: is, uh, is set UID impossible with uh, with nine P? It looks like it's not part of the protocol. Don't know I about tried uh, it, to be honest. Nine P to so this set you. UID on directories or on anything. It, it won't do. It won't do. So sudo temp. It won't. It won't do. It won't do the. Uh, the Can you do SU? No. Oh, yeah. You can use this. Uh, actually, I don't know. Could could could. I mean, try to that's right now. Normal, but I don't think uh, so. A user in the right group in real and try to use SU. If SU works at all, then at least set UID binaries work. No, no, no. it it doesn't because it it gives it gives an error if you try. Um, uh, you know the error. Yeah. Okay, uh, user. Yeah, not running it, not running set UID. It doesn't, it doesn't do it. I, I had to do a trust. Um, hang on, I wrote it somewhere. It's going to be hard to see the in trust because uh, the uh, set UID is part of the exec. Oh so well, I don't doing know. Well, I don't know what I'm doing. Into a UID <laughs> binary is going to change your UID. Well, it's impossible to set. Yeah, it's impossible to set uh, set UID. So four seven five five, nothing, nothing will happen. You can do, you can do it all day long. Now, now, of course, this might be relevant to whichever VM I snatched and stuff like that. But oh, I yes. can't get it to work. And and I couldn't get it to work when using. Um, on FreeBSD 14.1 with Debian using 9P share, I couldn't set do a set UID either. So I think it's on the, I don't know if it's on the Beehive side or on, I guess it's on the Beehive side, right? It's probably, it's or probably could, something, right, I'm getting, guessing it's something in lib 9P. Lib 9P is kind of strict compared to Freebsd. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. For it's, 9P 2000, there's a Unix extension and uh, it may uh, at least have an encoding how to transfer that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I can I can forget about I can forget about sockets also. I, I assume that's that's the pipe dream. Well, that's what yeah. You I would I would mount a tempfs onto onto var run or something. Yeah, yeah C right. scripts should already help you there, but it may be that they only support read only and NFS, so that we would have to be taught to auto detect nine p. So, uh, but you can manually enable those uh, features in the uh, in rc.conf. 
Uh, and if you have enable. just an empty slash var, then it should also auto uh, trigger. Or an empty slash var db or slash var run, just uh, one of those uh, should just trigger the right setup behavior. But yeah, you really have to read the implementation details for that because just like NFS root, it's uh, seldom tested these days. Well, I'm and excited to- from its time. I'm, I'm excited to get some jails that share the same namespace as my VMs. That could, uh, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, but I bet you <laughs> I'll figure something out. What do you I'm mean share the same namespace? I mean, share the same root. Oh, yeah, okay. So if it's lightning round, uh, I tried to build the example 9P server, which worked in the past, but it looks like it may have broken. Um, I'm putting the link in chat. Uh, um, and it looks like, Vina, you have a question relating. I'll grab, I'll copy that. We'll get to that in a sec. Uh, so when Yakub uh, brought in the server to Beehive itself, he included a simple standalone server, and it's just a make file and a C file, and just type make and have a nice day, but that seems to have broken. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. I will put this down below. We covered that. Okay, so then I see panic on debug. Surprises. Who wrote that? Is that Daniel Yu? Um, where did I write that? What does that not sound like me? Not as root. I can't change file times. Is that the? Oh yeah, that was weird. I that was just my first try, but it did. Sure. But then I did root nine p, and I had no problems. Can you try so that again? Because that might have been fixed by the one which um, Michael came across. Michael, okay. It could be Michael's bug. <laughs> okay. Great. It's not like laws. Whenever a law is named after someone, it's generally a bad law. And if a bug is named after someone, <laughs> let's not make that a law. Michael, <laughs> this is a special case. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, with. Okay, then that said, I put in some just links on various stuff I found because it's this is broadly uncharted territory in humanity. So, uh, so anyway, I put those there. No worries. Um, trust. I saw that. No, I was not building with trust. So there's that. Um, anything else related to nine P at this time? Okay. Uh, shall we shift gears to Vine? I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, sure, let's for a moment. Vine, what is going on? You had joined a call not too long ago and you were looking for a reproducible issue and Jan just provided to relating to jail escape. Go ahead. Hello, I am audible. Hello. Okay, so my question is that uh, I uh, in previous call, you said, give me this link of this bug. Michael, give me this link of this bug. But I am not able to find why this bug is working. In uh, some 12.1 uh, and 12.3, it is working. Huh. Yes. So it is Means working. Why we are setting the enforce state is equal to 1 now? Sorry. 12.1 uh, previously. And yeah. twelve point three also. They seem to work fine, or you couldn't reproduce it. Uh, could not reproduce. Uh, I can reproduce, and I am able to get the root. To... No, able to reproduce. Oh, okay. So does that meet your criteria? Well, that's what you're trying to uh, find an example of. No, no, no. Uh, why this is working? Just I want to know about that. Why it isn't working? Yes. We are setting enforce state is equal to one now. So why if we set enforce state is equal to two, why it is not working then? And if we are setting enforce state is equal to one, it is working. And I am able to see root directory there. Uh, did anyone, does that make sense to anyone? 
so just to recap, what behavior do you see in 14.1? It is still a problem or it appears to be fixed? In 14.1, it is fixed. Okay, got it. Then, if I'm not mistaken, that sounds like it reaches your goals. There is a, a tangible problem that at some point had a fix and you could reproduce it unless you're looking for one oh. that is yet not fixed, such as perhaps the ones that uh, Jan gave here, if, if I understand everyone correctly. Yeah, I just know want to know the reason behind that, why it is working in 12.1. Uh, there, sh well, let's look at the bug. Was there a a fix with this commit kind of thing, or is it still reported as open? Um, oh, open. did you? There you go. <laughs> in, so the bug was fixed in a security patch. So have you installed the patch or not? Uh, I already installed. The... Because it, sorry, if you installed the twelve dot one, sorry, uh, the old version there. Um, where it was vulnerable, and then you um, run FreeBSD update on it if it's still working, or just build it from source. Um, you have to make sure that you're not following the when building from source the release engineering branch, or you have to go into that branch and then roll back the last few commits which contain the bug fix. Uh, or you have to go into the real release branch as in the unpatched release, not the release engineering branch, which receives the bug fix and security patches. So if you, and almost no guide out there will tell you to build the release as is without uh, post release bug fixes, because this, there are so few use cases for that, but we're producing an old vulnerability. Uh, and writing an exploit for that, just so that you can use it as regression test, for example, uh, would be one of the very few uh, use uses for that, other than just reproducing old uh, release artifacts. I'm not finding a FreeBSD link, but I did find this link that uh, mentions what might be it. It mentions the dot dot escape. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, that to request uh, that you perform the jail attaching in a system call order, which the base system commands do not. So, um, yes, it's a real vulnerability, but we lucked out so that the normal commands are not exploitable. But if you call uh, libj yourself or directly call the system calls using just libc, then it would be uh, vulnerable if you did it in a different order than the jail command just happens to do it. Okay. okay. Does that help? So, yeah. And what enforce uh, enforce our app is doing jail? Uh, repeat that. Does it enforce uh, the yeah. underscore stat FS is there now in jail? I'm typing in comment section. So hopefully that sets you in the right direction. Uh, then the question is, does Enforce StatFS1 exist in jail? Does that sound right? I'll put, drop it in the doc here. Uh, question. Uh, Jan, does that ring a bell for you? Um. The jail can't change its own uh, enforced .fs setting uh, unless you have already exploited the kernel. So enforced .fs, uh, basically, the different levels are from the jail sees only a single file system to the jail sees its noun point, but the mount point uh, path uh, is in relative to the uh, 
jail root directory, and then we're at the highest setting, it can see the real mount points. Normally, the set, setting it to one is a good idea because then you can use uh, start VFS to as normally, and all your uh, mount points just are without the jail root prefix. So that it feels like a normal freebase user land. That's why that's my preferred setting. Even if lots of use cases for jails don't care. Um, but exposing the full path with setting it to two, that can be confusing to commands, but because then if they use stat VFS on a mount point, they get a path as mount path, which uh, isn't usable in almost all circumstances, unless it just accidentally happens to have that mount point too, but normally it would just be an invalid path. Thanks. Does that help, Michael? Welcome, uh, uh, Kratonian. Yeah, do you know Kratonian? Nope, just joined. Yeah, I see that. So welcome, Kratonian. Uh, Vine, drop any other questions in the chat, and I hope this helps, OK? OK, OK, I will drop. Super. No, drop it in the chat. Yeah, you don't have to drop off the call. Uh, welcome, Kratonian. Do you want to introduce yourself, and do you have any uh, topics? And do you go by any other names? <laughs> uh, no topics. Uh... I, I guess my government name is Creighton Shingarande, since you guys have all of yours up there. And if you want me to switch, no, that's fine. fine. No, no, I, I just, no, you I just have to switch. No, nope, not at all. It's Go fine. ahead. Okay, I just went by my um, Discord handle because that's who I'm on Discord, right? Yeah. Um, I am a junior network engineer. I work for a small MSP. I'm also a Windows programmer in the sense that. I program C Sharp and .NET uh, applications, right? And like apps, uh, server apps as well, PowerShell. Um, One quick I point, use... you're super boomy. Is there any way to reduce your audio gain or distance from the mic? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could. Cool. You're putting I us to shame. Distance. Awesome. Uh, Here, let me. Developer, and I'd love to know what brings you to a jail and zones call. Uh, I want to be involved in the free BSD community. I'm a big fan. Um, I'm trying to switch over from Ubuntu to have like just free BSD. Um, what I really want to do is I want to go to um, net BSD or open BSD because um, it's supposed to be more secure, but mm -hmm. free BSD seems to be a good start. I also want to um, later down the line, once I uh, know the operating system a little bit more is I want to contribute, you know, I'm, yeah. Are there what? corners of a Unix system that you are most familiar with and that interest you most? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say so, but uh, one thing that I'm interested in is trying to get Docker on FreeBSD. I, I believe I'm able to use like Podman as a container orchestrator or um, Jails, right? Um, but yeah, nothing I mean, it's, I'm it's super right. familiar with. Uh, yeah. Doug on the call so, is in fact the person to talk to. So go ahead, Doug. Yeah, um, so uh, Podman does work. Um, it uses jails underneath uh, and um, it supports root, what Linux people call rootful jails. So they're, they're, um, they run with, you know, uh, you, you can't run, um, <clears throat> you can't run jail, or you can't run uh, containers as non root users, but that's okay for a some. Well, it's okay for my use cases. Um, it's a Docker workalike. It should support almost everything that the Docker CLI does. Separately from Podman, though, we do have a port of container D, which is the underlying kind of um, container engine for the Docker command line. And that's a bit less mature than the Podman port, but there is potential for actual Docker. Um, so container D with the Docker um, command line. Um, that's some ways off though. Um, but for most uh, use cases, just try Podman. I a lot of people like to. I've seen people with T-shirts that say alias Podman equals uh, alias Docker equals Podman, because it <laughs> should just work. 
Cool. So, um, so try try it out and see what see what works for you. Yes, Jan. One of the differences uh, you will probably stumble over is that in FreeBSD for over 20 years, you had most of them mechanisms to do what Linux does with containers, but nobody put it together in an opinionated tool like the ones you're probably used to from Linux. So instead you find that because the mechanism is part of the operating system, but the opinionated tooling is not, that there are lots of um. different ways to utilize jails. Um, and because there's by now almost a quarter of a century of history around jails, uh, you will also find abandoned tools from over a decade ago, uh, some even abandoned over a decade ago. Uh, so um, because it was someone's pet project, they, it worked for them while they needed it. Now there's a better way or they no longer need it. And search engines are notoriously bad at understanding this. <laughs> so it, you can just stumble over 15 year old documentation telling you that you really have to log out and make sure that you lay out your file system in such a way that your precious 36 gigabytes SCSI disk does not overflow right. with crazy null of S and Sumlink uh, setups, which are almost unmaintainable uh, and will blow up lots of tools. But hey, it works for a web server. And you can run a thousand web servers on, uh, on your Pentium 3. Yes, thank you, Jan. Uh, just point of order, my browser froze entirely, so I'm jumping on with another machine. But Kratonian. Uh, I hope that sets you in the right direction. I don't know if you've watched any of the previous recordings, but hopefully they have provided a little more background on what we the kind of things we've been working on. And uh, welcome, Dan L. Uh, do you have any topics? And Hopefully my audio hasn't also died. And Antrenig, welcome. Can anyone hear me? Or has my yes, audio died? Hello. Okay. Yes. hello. Okay, super. What's up? Apol apologies. I'm connecting from the former Soviet Union because we have no water, we had no electricity, and we had no internet, but the internet at least came back. So it's like a whole uh, maintenance day, I guess, in the whole city. Yes. Goodness. Uh, yeah. Um, my updates. Not so much. I discovered that the FreeBS, FreeBSD doesn't have, or it has, but it might be broken, NDP proxy. Uh, the idea is if you have a, a single slash 64, well, not that actually. The idea is sometimes uh, packets are routed to you. And sometimes packets, uh, like, uh, sorry, IPs are routed to you. And sometimes uh, someone in the network is going to say, hey, who is this IP? Right? And you have to respond back. Uh, in IPv4, we do that with ARP. In IPv6, uh, Jan might correct me, but I think we use, well, technically it's NDP. Uh, but yeah. So, so I had a single slash 64 in a network of a customer, and I wanted to have a jail inside of that slash 64, but I needed VNet for other reasons. Uh, and it was not responding to it for numerous reasons because that cloud provider was just not good. For some reason, they're also very famous. They're also from Germany. Uh, of course, the ideal um, scenario would be to use an alias jail, right? With, you know, IP6 yes. equals and just be done with it. But it, we had a more complex setup in this case. Um, but yeah, apparently there is an NDP proxy kernel module available in ports. It's very useful if you're trying to do jails like that, or if you're trying to maybe even set up a WireGuard instance, right? Where, um, where uh, yes. 
Um, we are getting a bit off topics for jails, and it is possible. And if you're talking about Hetzner, they do not care about uh, their routing is set up in such a way that you don't even have to proxy. You just have to forward if it's forwarded. So just set uh, IP6 forwarding to enable, and it works. Just set IP6. I'll try that again then. Yes, I'll try that So again. you don't have to bother with them because they do layer free forwarding. So they just route your whole mm -hmm. prefix to that port and then expect you to pick that up. Yes. Uh, at least uh, I've but, done that for but the I last guess, But I guess that wouldn't years. work for VPN, right? If I'm doing WireGuard, then I would need the proxy. Mm, no, then you need proper routing. Mm -hmm. uh, the NDP proxy or R proxy is only needed for other systems on the layer two segment where the address belongs. So, for example, if you're in the default gateway, wants to uh, know which uh, MAC address has this IP address, mm -hmm. then it does either a neighbor lookup via IPv6 or an app lookup. Yes, and okay, I see your point. And then it Broadcasts or an IPv6 multicasts of a query gets oh, it. And the point. proxy is yep. so that a system which does not consider this one of its own IP addresses replies as a proxy for the system which has it as a local IP address and would reply but can't because it's not on the same layer two segment. What then mm -hmm. happens is that everyone else learn, learns the MAC address of the proxy of a proxied IP address. Mm -hmm. And that causes the layer two network to uh, forward the frames to the proxy, which then gets it in as an input, but it's not one of its local addresses. So it has to be a router for all the families. Mm -hmm. um, and then it works. Okay. Um... Um, it can't work with a bridge. But if you just bridge, that would also uh, remove the need because uh, I know from personal experience that with Hetzner, it's not a problem to uh, use a bridge because they don't care about your MAC address. They are set up in such a way that they don't trust you anyway, which is mm -hmm. what a hoster should do. They, they shouldn't trust or then not really trust and filter your MAC address. They should just set it up in such a way that your MAC address doesn't matter, just route this mm -hmm. IP prefix to this switch port and mm -hmm. throw it at the customer machine. And mm -hmm. then the customer machine is responsible for everything. And every customer port is its own uh, uh, to broadcast them unless you configure some uh, VLANs, which you can okay. also do on the command uh, so in the control plane, which can be useful if you really wanted to, but hey, mm -hmm. you can also do the tunneling yourself if you distrust your hoster, which is a very valid point of view. Okay, makes sense. Uh, I also had a question, which was uh, something like this. Let's see. Um... Uh, Michael, can I share my screen or are yes, you? Yes, please. I'm relaunching my browser. So it'd be great if you share your screen. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have now I have three different prototypes of a jailer file. Um, let's see. How do I do this? Share application. I think it's this one. Why did they change the UI again? Jesus. Okay. Share. Can you see my terminal? Yes. We see a single mm -hmm. window in a reasonable Good. aspect ratio and text size. Very Good. Uh, so this is uh, my third attempt. Yes, Michael. Okay, we have quite a few new people. What do you mean a jailer file? Oh, okay, great. So for those who are uh, new, I do have a tool that I created for my company, but now we're using it for a lot of customers. I'll just minimize this a bit, sorry, uh, which is called Jailer. It's a, as the name says, it's a jail manager. It has a different mentality than most common jail managers in the idea that 
well, yeah, most common, but not all, is that it acts more like a library than a framework. Most jail managers act like a framework, like this is how you're supposed to do things, etc. In this case, it's more like a library uh, mentality uh, in it. Uh, I guess what I wanted, yeah, so that's the long story short. It is pretty stable. We use it inside of our product, uh, which is a honeypot system. Uh, but I also use it on servers, obviously. Um, so jailer file is my attempt to have something similar to the Docker file for application for for CI CD environment. That's one, and the other one is let's say we have a lot of customers who ask the same thing, right? DNS, DHCP, uh, Nextcloud, or uh, someone wants to deploy a SOC, a security operations center. It's usually 99, 90% of the time the same applications. Now the applications in a good scenario are available in ports. Let's say, for example, OpenVAS, right? If they're trying to do some kind of security work. Uh, or sometimes they are not. So we have to either port them manually and upstream or, and put them inside of FreeBSD ports, or they're too complex to put in the ports at the moment. So we have to, uh, just to get the job done, have it inside of a jail. Um, it has the idea of images, jailer image list, I think. Yes, there you go. Uh, and it also have an idea of, let's see, jailer init info. It does some basic things like, you know, some environment variables, it's ZF. It's it's married to ZFS. Uh, it doesn't work without ZFS. A jailer file is my attempt as a Docker file alternative. Um, again, one other thing that I noticed in the other tools is that they're trying to bring a lot of the um, Docker ideas to uh, FreeBSD. Uh, my problem with that is that I think. The, Docker's ideas are good, but the implementation is awful, but people are trying to be more like implementation like Docker. They're like, oh, well, we'll try. Like, it's it's very close to Docker. I'm like, no, I don't want it to be very close to Docker. I want it to be as far away from Docker as possible be be because Docker has a lot of bad ideas. So anyway, long story short, that's the idea of it. Um, so it's actually a shell script, right? I, I want some feedback on this. I think I sent this to uh, Daniel a while back. Um, the idea is that it's a shell script with some predefined strings, like name from which is, you know, if you're basing it on other image, uh, a version, if you know, uh, and the health check. And these are actually just functions. Yes, you can use column, column inside of a function name in FreeBSD's POSIX compatible shell. It also gives it a very nice way to, um, a very nice way to have like an, an idea of module, column, column, function, or like package, column, column, module, column, column, function. A uh, very neat way to you know separate things, and these are actually functions. These get these never get executed on the host. They always get executed in a jailed environment or a chrouted environment, depending on the scenario. And my idea, and the Jan's idea was, is that it's either a file with these predefined function names, such as build, which is the building step, health check, which is the health check step. This will be run by the daemon process internally, and save it inside of var log health check. And if the exit code is not zero, then the jail will be restarted, right? A very basic idea there. I have no idea what to do with the logs. I'm still thinking about this. Maybe an, a variable with a bunch of log files or log directories to monitor and export and send to syslog, or I don't know, from syslog, you can send to Splunk or Elastic or um, whatever you're using. Run, which is like, a command that should be run when the jail is executed. Trace, I still have no idea how to integrate this yet. This is for like production debugging. Again, something that Docker has never even thought about. And maybe even custom commands. And Jan's idea was it's either a file with these predefined names or a directory where inside of it, there's a file called health check. And inside of the health check file, is the following content, right? Or there's a file called build inside of the file named build, there's the following content. That's the overall idea. Uh, this is the simplest one that I could achieve, both from the implementation point of view and from debuggability. And obviously you can source things, right? You can do like, I don't know, source, whatever, whatever. Um, and for copying things, the way it would work is that since this is in a d file named app zero, sorry, this is inside of a directory called app zero, all of app zero would be copied inside of the jail. 
in the building process. So like it would always be available there. So like if you're copying index HTML, which I think I am in here, yes, I am. It would be that that file would be copied, you know, in inside the jail and then this would be executed inside of the jail. So the file would be copied properly. Uh, this is the overall idea. I'm just looking for basic feedback of uh, either features. Again, I'm not looking for too many features. Um, uh, and if you think there's like something that could be done better and any, any, any thoughts on the logs and the trace would be awesome. Cause I'm stuck there. Yes. Uh, bash me as they say. Okay. So if, uh, for the logging, um, you can, if you don't insist on using just the host system syslog D, uh, so, mm -hmm. sorry, just the base system syslog D, you could mm -hmm. have a fancier syslog D where you can, through runtime reconfiguration, instruct it to uh, create new sockets, which it then knows that those belong to a jail, so that okay. it has that context to it, uh, in okay. which you're logging. And then you just create a directory, put the sockets in, um, and nullfs mount them over in okay. those directories. Um, then it should just work so that anything which uses syslog works. If you want to consume the log directories, it's also fine. You could, uh, or you can put a FIFO in there and use the <laughs> jail system. That would be the other way that you just give it a pipe and mm -hmm. that pipe is consumed by the host syslog D and the jail syslog D is just configured to forward into that pipe. Oh, I see what you mean. So like make var log messages a pipe where the no. host can read from. No, okay. In addition to that, okay, to var log messages, for, just like you would forward remote logging, and of course, you can also use the traditional way of forwarding uh, the log messages. Yeah, I mean, all the school syslog would work fine, of course. Yeah, exactly. Just, um, yeah, just add a single line at top of syslog dconf and send it to someplace else. That might also be a good idea. Another uh, way thing you could do is you could create a, a sort of terminal master and then just basically run the jade command in the foreground and consume the mass output to the master uh, PTY. Oh, I missed that part, that, go again. So um, normally jades are configured so that they have access to their uh, TTYs. Yes. So that you can have interactive sh shell sessions. Uh, because it's, it's so common, it's part of the default configuration. Yes. Uh, in DevFS words and so on. And if you have that, you could have the, your jail just create a, a PTY device, just open it, and have some kind of process which will just allow you to reattach as the uh, single use, uh, similar to DTAG, which is a screen without the multiplexing. So mm -hmm. just attaching, detaching, and draining everything. So a combination oh. of just Dita and T. So yeah, Jan, Jan, that, that does also give me the idea that, for example, instead of, uh, where was it? Instead of changing syslog D to send everything via the syslog protocol to a location, what yeah. about uh, sending everything to the console? And the console is always logged, right? Um, because because jails they, normally I, don't have uh, their own system console. Wait, let me just um, just let me check because this is the default one in Jailer. Uh, yeah, there is like exec console log in Jailer. Everything gets logged yeah. to var log jail jail name. Okay, okay, I see your point. But what would that be a good that idea? That isn't. That's not truly the same as the as dev console. That's I see a log see. file that the std out, I, uh, out and std error. I think I'm not so about mm -hmm. standard error, but standard out at least is written to. Okay. Okay. And one hack would be, uh, which would work if there's no protection against that built into the jail command, is to use a named FIFO there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So okay. that uh, you have something reading from that named FIFO. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, is, is there a way? Is there a way to redirect all of the STD outs of every process in the jail to a single file? Is that even? Yes. 
so there is a possibility of doing because that would be really interesting like no matter if you have a single process that you're running let's say nginx or you have a whole infrastructure kind of thing like let's say three python applications and an nginx mm -hmm. reverse proxy just everything gets sent to std out and then std out is redirected to uh, or and std error everything is written to a single how would that process be is, is that in glconf no um, you would have to build it on top of a mechanism gel cons and the gel command and just the way unix works the idea is that here that you the first process in the jail mm -hmm. get sets up its file descriptors or mm -hmm. has its file descriptors set up in such a way that it works and then everything else via fork it just inherits those default ah, file descriptors and as long as you don't replace or close them your mm -hmm. standard out and standard error ends up in your default log being stream. Uh, and I, that's I might be wrong. Exactly how the daemon to run it and uh, a six RC and so on mm -hmm. of the world do it. The whole DJB daemon tools family of service mm -hmm. managers has worked like that since the late mm -hmm. 90s and it just works. I might <laughs> be wrong, but is, is it console log the STD error and STD out? Exec console uh, log. Let me check. Because uh, I would think that honestly, like if I stop a jail and change its, uh, let's say, RC local, which is executed by RCD and, uh, and RC. Uh, so the main page says that it re redirects both standard out and standard error. Nice. Okay. So like uh, if, if Docker people come into here and they're used to like having Nginx writing everything to STD out, it would write into the console log, which yes, means and you would... can okay. uh, you can just tail that file. Yeah, exactly. Yes, tail okay. dash n number of lines uh, dollar lines, and then you just replace the whole um, console yeah, yeah. with the. Uh, or, or 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 if you're using if you're using an enterprise solution, everything in var log jail would be just sent to Splunk or Elastic or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, that makes sense. That that that's actually a very um, neat solution. But yeah. I don't think that it works where the, the jail command stays around to act as a proxy if you uh, rotate the log file. So uh, ah, because of that, um, but let me check the source code for a second. Jailer, uh, let's say J zero. J zero has etc rc. And here, if so I just if do something you, uh, stupid, let's say I do something stupid like um, echo uh, or see just finished so, um, its thing. Uh oh. It's Yo, yeah, never. <laughs> Jailer start J0. And here we would do a tail of varlog jail j0.log. Okay, so go. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, this is perfect. Oh, this is perfect. Oh, this is a very nice. Okay, but that I, that still doesn't solve my problem of you know, uh, what should uh, this function <laughs> look like? <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, but um, yeah, it's it's still, it's still a good place to start. That's for sure. So, in my opinion, it shouldn't look like anything because it mm -hmm. shouldn't be there. Uh huh. Instead, it should be part of the environment and mm -hmm. not something you have to. Confinica individually. So that you just capture that for every J by default and mm -hmm. that's it. And th let me check for a second when it opens the const log. So uh, in command.c of uh, the jail command, source mm -hmm. code, there's a, in the function run command, there's a const char uh, pointer called const log. Mm -hmm. And that one is set to the uh, parameter you just, uh, okay. It ch runs check uh, path on that. And then, uh, so we have to check the check path function. And then it calls co an open on it to get the file descriptor. With read only create a pen. So, uh, does what does check path do? Um, uh, 
Okay, so it just makes sure that according to the comments, the the mount point and the console log path are mm -hmm. valid absolute paths and not some links. Um, mm -hmm. So in that case, you should be able to give it a name pipe mm -hmm. as console log path. And as long as you have something draining that pipe, mm -hmm. anytime you run a mod run anything on a jail with that console lock in there, you're mm -hmm. fine. Otherwise, it will just refuse to start. So that service has to be there. Um, so yeah, yes, you can I do can it. also do like dev console here. Yeah. And then I now, can do uh, sys, is it syslog uh, or syslog d? Syslog d. Service. Here be dragons. I know. Because okay. you have i octals on the console device. Oh, okay. Okay. And okay. I think one of them replaces the default console device. Yeah. So yeah, which is this one. Yeah. You, I, I will need to comment that. As one. in, you may be able to really confuse users if you. That's something you would do in a capture the flag tournament if you want <laughs> some advanced task to just. But, okay, yeah, fair, fair point, fair point, fair point, yes. But uh, if you have some kind of service which uh, would pass the output from, I don't know, jail dash e. Um, jail dash e, okay. So you have little. It can even be a shell script. Yeah. Um, if you want, which just passes the output of that, finds for each J just the names of the jails. Mm -hmm. As and for each jail, it would create a named pipe and just drain that and log rotate it. Or forward yeah. it into syslog if you want. Yeah. You can do all of that. Okay, that, um, this does give me some good ideas to start with if someone is deploying and the application. Funnily you know. enough, the um, Demon Roots OS 6 uh, logging helpers, things like the multi log command uh, of Demon Tools or um, svlog d of run it, you do exactly that. That's how logging mm. works in those um, well designed service yeah. managers, yeah. unlike yeah. the Linux specific one, which should not be named. Well, well, Dev Console is definitely not the STD out because it, 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 whatever, no, it, no. It, yeah, whatever jail, it, the jail is the way. No, it's not. Dev Console is uh, not Dev TTY. Dev Console yeah. is the system console. So it would come out of your video output or your serial console. If you got wanted it. to go to your current controlling TTY, set it to mm -hmm. slash Dev TTY. Slash and... Dev slash TTYV0, I guess. But I don't know that you. Sure. Hmm? No, no. Death slash Dev TTY is a special name. Dev. You have to Dev. unhide it in the jail and then things should happen. I see what you mean. Okay. In slash Dev, uh, yeah. Oh, but so yeah, it's it for itself. Okay. Okay. Basically, slash Dev TTY is the device you can open. To uh, regain a file descriptor to your controlling TTY for your I session, see. if you have one, it's I how see. shell job management works. Oh, uh, yeah. it's how xarc o can reopen standard n. Uh -huh. so uh -huh. Okay, got it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll dig a little bit more deep into this. Uh, in that case, maybe. Um, well, I'm not sure yet. What would I do with this? Because because I, I want the user to do like package install mm -hmm. uh, Nginx, service Nginx enable start. Okay, great. Everyone's happy. Now everything is going to get logged into var log Nginx. Yep. Now there are there are two ways to do this. One of them is you modify Nginx and tell it to your syslog. The other one is, is you somehow make sure that var log Nginx's content also appears uh, on the host somewhere, just like I'm doing. So, uh, one of the developer. things you could do here mm -hmm. is you could specify jail paths 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then there would be some command like tail dash uppercase F, mm -hmm. uh, which would just cons read all of those uh, follow log quotations. Of course, and of course, yes. Write to send it out. Yes. Okay, all now I see what you mean. Uh, so you could just have a tail dash F and then the log files you want to consume and then... I see what you mean. Okay, that's actually also a very good idea. Yeah. Partner jail, mm -hmm, similar mm -hmm. to what uh, Kubernetes, uh, what is that the thing you can put in a port to um, the companion services? I forgot mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. name they have for it. But then you would have it, my jail and my jail dot log or something. No, you can't okay. have a dot. Uh, my jail dash log. Okay, um, that that does make sense. And for the for the health check, uh, I think I removed my implementation because I was playing around. But it should be somewhere in the chat with. Why so uh, what... do you put a custom health check in the in there um, instead of just saying when jail dot start exits the service must be ready? Go again. So why does your jail uh, exit dot start? Return mm -hmm. success before the service is up. Return Why don't you have before... a jail an exec dot start, which mm -hmm. starts your service and then pulls mm -hmm. for it to become ready? Uh, I see what you mean. Waits for it to become ready without oh, telling you if you find a solution well, which works. I, I had something have like an... I had something like this, which I've put in the RC local. Mm -hmm which runs daemon and then daemon, let's see what I'm doing here, uses mm -hmm. nobody, uh, makes sure it's restarted, names it health mm -hmm. check, this is for syslog, executes, this is the original jailer file, obviously, mm -hmm. sources it and runs the health check and then it puts the um, exit code into a directory, which then I read, the, sorry, into a file, which then I read the file, if it's not zero, then something is broken, obviously. Now, uh, maybe it would be also a good idea to do this health check before doing daemon, doing it outside of daemon, like basically having something like this, as far as I can tell, right? Without and the full, I, obviously. I would Without recommend the against loop. doing it the way you're doing it, because what you're doing is the same thing our uh, rc.sub remade and the rc.d mechanism, which is mm -hmm. you explicitly tie yourself to shell and a specific style of shell script. Uh, so you're not give it, able to run arbitrary code in a clean environment. Instead, you have to use a preloaded shell. But, no, uh, no, you I don't. You, consider you, you, it a you, contaminated you, you, shell. You can actually. I mean, you, you, you would do something like this if you mm -hmm. want. Like uh, you can do, let's say, Python uh, check health. Yes. Dot pi. I mean, it it would execute if you have if you have that yes, file in here. Would. Yeah. But of course, what I would recommend is that you instead specify the calling convention as a at the at the CLI level, as in, okay. and then you have to make it easy to extend for shell. You have a shell file you can include you and that can. one includes the get up s stuff to decode the polling convention so that you would run i don't uh -huh. know the script with a dash c flag and then it per convention dash c means do a health check like this is that what you mean no that is also no. not what i mean what i mean is okay. The jailer stuff should be a should it should be possible to write that thing in C or in C plus plus or in Rust or in Go. It shouldn't matter. It should not be tied to shell as the implementation language. And you mean jailer file itself? The executable code part should not be shell specific. The executable code path should not be. I mean, well, th this is what wh wh what I'm thinking, right? So let's say if you're trying to do a build and your yeah. build, you like your build process is not this, right? I, I guess technically, it could be something like, 
CC no. build no, 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 dot no. CC and then build CC. Obviously, you would. I'm not this. getting the point across. My I criticism not, yeah. is that there's even a shell function here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. The, young, the whole, I, I, instead I, I, I don't of know. just spawning a sub. So I assume what you're doing is you're starting a sub shell and then sourcing that file and then expecting to find that function. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, instead now I get of what doing it that way, I would recommend you run that file and give it its arguments on the command line as argument vector and have a convention of which uh, just options and flags these commands have to accept. Does that make sense? So, so that you... So, so jailer file itself could be a C program, right? Written, a program written in C where it would check mm -hmm. If the first argument or an environment variable, for example, is set mm -hmm. to build or is set to health check, that's what you mean. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Now I see what you're going. That's similar to how Git works with subcommands. Yes. Okay. And Git hooks and other things. Okay. No, Git hooks are part of a specific command yeah, implementation, yeah. but the subcommand that you had would have jailer build. Uh -huh. And then some jail. And what it would do is we okay. would run that it would the jailer build command okay. would instead do the following. It would so instead of um, me sourcing this binary and running jailer build in, in my implementation, right? At the mm -hmm. bottom, it would be something like if uh arg one equals I'm just pseudo coding, of course. Uh, build, uh, then uh, jailer uh, build. But in case of a C program, no. people can do whatever they want. No, you can do better in shell. If I, what? If I you can, can what? do better in shell. I can do better. Okay, just source it and then check um, for environment no, variables. You run, do uh, you build up dollar uh, add? You build up dollar add, okay. And modify the, the argument vector until you have it, and then you uh, just run your argument vector. I see what you mean. Um, and if you want to decode anything, you use get op as the build-in. I see what you mean. Jailer file as uh, a program that checks for so you... orgs. Uh, so, and... Um... Uh, and the vars, I guess that would be a good place to start with. So it's that's good, actually a perfect good, idea. Good. So like people can build the their jail with uh -huh. sorry. So, so like people can build their jail with that, other things. Okay. My criticism with the way you're currently approaching mm -hmm. it is that you're intermingling the configuration and the code too tightly. So that I see. you are always stuck in the uh, Touring tar pit that is shell. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. Right. You cannot but, abstract away mm -hmm. from that because you're mm -hmm. tied to the language in your design. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can never have some kind of abstraction. Oh, but I if see you design you it the other way around and the common code so that not every jail configuration has to copy and paste the same code can mm -hmm. then be mm -hmm. slurped into that process mm -hmm. it only needs a fraction of your whole jailer source code it doesn't need every jailer function or at least it shouldn't oh, yeah, yeah yeah i see and what you, you don't I want you users to have especially if you're not creating a sub shell modify the state of the jailer shell script and modify all the global variables potentially maybe even accident accidentally and have one which clashes because Shell is dynamically and not lexically scoped, even if you use local variables. So it's confusing but powerful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the way to avoid all that is to use sub processes and start from a clean process instead of a sub shell. I'm just thinking here, just to be mm -hmm. sure. Jailer file. What did I do? Oh, of course, this is not POSIX shell. Jailer file, jailer uh, logs, was it? Right, okay. 
Okay, so like I could have a good implementation of like what I'm supposed to give to the user in the jailer file, whether it's my shell version or the user's Python Go, whatever they, they want to do version, and what I'm expecting in return, right? So in some function cases, I'm expecting a exit code. In other function cases, I'm expecting a string, for example, for the logs. So then they, I can integrate this with other subsystems. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is a perfect idea, actually. This is this would this would not be hard to implement. This would be very easy. And it's way more powerful, like in, in the idea that people can uh, use Turing complete programming languages instead of this syntax that you know I, I have in my mind, right? Like it doesn't matter what the thing is, it would just work basically. Yep. Uh, it becomes yeah. a problem when the common case is that you have to move things which are too complex yeah. to move as through the argument line or and you have to repass things too often. At that point, it becomes a pain, but at that point, I would be asking, why are you still writing in shell? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. I see what you mean. Okay. And the other and problem it, I see here and, is and that, it, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. uh, with your build commands, with your example there. Okay. That, what happens if there's a partial failure? What happens if there's a partial, uh, like package didn't work, for example, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, I no. Think... Let's say uh -huh. you do a CP dash uh -huh. R and forgot to put a slash at the end and so on. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. now uh, suddenly you have part of the files copied in and part of the files copied into a directory which already now exists. I see what you mean. Uh, similar mess. Yeah. Um, so you kind of have to make sure you everything you do there, if you do it in shell, is item potent. Mm -hmm. Which of course you can write item potent shell scripts. Uh, expecting every user of your tool to be able to write reliable item potent shell snippets mm -hmm. is a bad idea. I see what you mean. Okay. Because well, I mean, it's I, so error prone. Yeah. So well, easy I, I, to get wrong. Yeah. Well, I still, I mean, okay. I, I see what you, I mean, no, I mean, look, uh, that, that, um, how to explain this. That's a skill issue on the user side. No. Like uh, your CP, you're supposed to know when you're CPing. I know CP yes. is not a perfect utility, but you, you're supposed That's to. That's not what I mean. It's that. There are common patterns which you should help your users with. Okay. Like making files available. Of course, you should be able to run arbitrary commands mm -hmm. easily, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't be forced to use arbitrary to commands to do the common things. Look at something like the Bastille format or even Docker, where the common things are made easier than the generic case. I see what you mean. And that could be in the design I'm proposing as simple as having a libexec directory with item potent shell scripts where mm -hmm. you just give it arguments. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking like instead of package install dash j uh, has packages. Okay, like SPKG. I would have, and like it would be like something like this in here, which then I would somehow translate not, into. Not somehow through a script you've written and included, mm -hmm. include mm -hmm, your mm -hmm. batteries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't force it to run on your batteries, but include them. <laughs> okay, I see what you mean. Um, okay, or but I mean, I mean, look, I mean, I, I like the idea of that. The problem with something like that is. Those are features, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very good features. But if, if you do package, someone is going to ask for uh, a better CP. If you do CP, someone's going to ask for better this, better that. And then tell them to you... write it themselves and put it in the documented libexec directory. The... Yeah, of course, of course, of course. And make but... that part, thing part of your path. Yeah, yeah. But my. For my... Unix way. <laughs> yeah, of course. But but my problem is that like I don't think that I should be fixing that via jailer. I think that should be fixed upstream. 
that sure if you want to never have it fixed and to always have something to complain about then you're totally right <laughs> no no I'm, I'm saying like okay like l l let's take pack package for example right uh how would an idempotent package even behave i mean currently package is in a way idempotent right like if you do package mm, install and you give it name of packages p is it really like if 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 the package is available and it's not installed it will mm -hmm. install it if it's uh, available and installed it will not do anything the question if it's not available and it is not installed what would it do uh right so like th those are mm -hmm. good questions of course now the problem with like uh, i i would like these kind of issues to be fixed upstream right not inside of the jailer because again, like I said, I'm I trying understand. to. understand, but yeah. you have to, to be a yeah. useful tool, you have to work in a less than perfect world. Yeah. Well, what other things are there? I mean, service is obviously a very simple and common one, you know? Yes. And service, exactly. And the problem is a lot of the common ones are very close to item and only have. Common cases, for example, if you copy a file into a jail, mm -hmm. what happens if, um, if that file already exists or if there's a directory named just like the file? Mm -hmm. And now if you do a recursive copy and the directory is already there or not, of mm -hmm. course, there, it's a syntax in CP to make that or you could use us and there are lots of options. The other problem is how often do you want to run those things uh, so that you don't, you probably don't want to do a package base based uh, base system installation every jail start mm -hmm. because it would be at least on a reasonably fast system 15 seconds or so for each yeah. startup wasted yeah. and lots of IO. Yeah. Okay, I see um, what you mean. I see what you mean. Uh, let's see what else. The Any other check, thoughts? Um... Uh, the health check. I mean, what all I'm thinking. Um, wait, where, where was that code? Uh, oopsie. Vim mm -hmm. paste. There we go. This is what I'm doing for the health check at the moment, uh, which I'm, I'm personally happy with. But uh, like, like you said, it doesn't have to be like this. It can be uh, an actual other code like just jailer file you know basically like this jailer file health check right would be the actual process here uh, which would do yes. the health check itself yeah what do you mean by health check and have you tried sh-n which i find very useful before you accept garbage that so a... so so a health check is a function mm -hmm. in this case which would be executed every number of seconds in this case i think it does every five seconds and the health check command itself does some execution. Uh, in, in the example that I have here, it would do, because this is an Nginx service, of course, it would do curl HTTP slash slash local host, right? So if Nginx is running properly, um, we, we assume that like this is all you need. So it would return a zero. Itself. Okay. Yeah, it, no, would, it, it would wouldn't return... work because curl is not installed and it would curl, curl, uh, curl mess is up your installed. locks. Curl is installed. Okay. Yeah. And it would pollute your logs because it would do a an, an dummy get. What you can do instead mm -hmm. is use uh, the socks.command. command. Socks command. Of course. No, no, no. You're not getting my point, Jan. This is a template. Like okay, I'm, yeah, yeah, I know. Again, I, I am the, the, the major difference mentality wise from every other tool that I saw and what I'm trying to build is two things. Okay. They do abstractions. I want to do automation. I hate abstractions. I don't want to go up in the stack. I just want to understand the stack, right? Instead of abstractions, I want to do automation. That's one. And the second thing is there everyone's acting as a framework. I want to act as a library. Like technically, very technically. Yes. If you use this jailer file and you build the image and you deploy the image and then you remove jailer completely from your base system, should still work. everything should work fine, which is not the scenario with the 99% of solutions, both on FreeBSD and on Linux. Mm -hmm. you, you see what I mean? 
So th that's my kid, main. Bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what um, I'm saying. Like they could do sock stat, and that that does make sense. Right? Sock stat, grep, nginx. Make sure it's listening on port eighty. Mm -hmm. Is technically working. Yes. And your run probably should be service uh, nginx start and not uh, curl. Uh, my run. I don't think I have a yeah, run. Call and run. run. Yes, this. Uh, a command has to run when the jail starts and has to return zero to make sure that the jail is started properly. Uh, yes, exactly. This is also a big problem that I have. Like, should it even return anything or should just this be running somehow? Uh, like, um, uh, like, this is like a first health check. I don't know how to even explain this. This is where I'm, this is the, the problem between the Docker mentality and the jail mentality is that in the Docker mentality, you're probably running a single binary, like a patch or a Python dash, whatever, and your or like Goonicorn or whatever, right? In jails, you might be running the whole infrastructure in a single jail. Uh, so th right. that's my problem. Yeah, this is one of my problems, and I don't know how to solve this. Uh, the, the run command is very weird in my mind. You know, like uh, so if, why, if if yeah, go on. Why call it run instead of start? Good idea. So That's... we have a exact dot start in the jail dot com exactly. and in the jail command, and the idea here is that it runs to completion normally, and yeah. the jail is. And that's kind of a problem, in my opinion, because it would be better if you had, but then you can no longer be uninstalled. If you had a kind of uh, supervisor which ran and then continuously ran it, of course, you can kind of build the, a poor man's version of that out of shell script using only base system commands. But that's kind of working with, with one hand tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. At least one hand. Yeah. Um, so a few little commands which should be available on the host make your life a lot easier. The, 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 these are also good ones. Like these are hard coded strings that I grab for. Like I grab for hashtag name to get the name of the image. Like in in the in the Python Go whatever version it could be like. A, Please, I'm like I'm gonna pass the second argument as get name, and it should return nginx. I guess like something like that, right? Or just exactly. name, uh, right? Um, yeah. No, yeah. the the name, in my opinion, should be a file. The file name. The name should be the file name. Um. Yes and no. By the way, yes and no. Uh. Yes, it would make things more uh unified. Right? No, because uh, I've seen CI CD pipelines a lot in my life, and people sometimes don't respect that. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? So, like that, that's, and also the file name is 99% of the time is going to be jailer file. I mean, sure, you can mod specify any file that you want, but that's going to be one of the other, like jail dash F, jailer file or dash F. A build the pipeline or whatever, right? So maybe, maybe I'll do both. Maybe I'll just the identity add some having the identity in them. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, again from... this hard co combining configuration and code in a way which is not healthy in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the from also, yeah. The from if it's default, it means the default image which is in here. Jailer image. Where is it? Image list. Uh, none of those it are default. It becomes uh, automatic instead. Why not have a dependency uh, on the default jail mm -hmm. in your jail.conf? Merge, use, let's say I want to set this one to the default. I would do that. And now that's the default. Yeah. Uh, sorry, go again what you were saying. Let me show you something. Mm -hmm. I will just grab... Uh, By the way, uh, uh, Kratonian, any thoughts in here? I, I I was looking at the chat. You're coming from Linux land lately, I got to say. Uh, if you have any thoughts, please throw in here. That would be nice. Uh, or maybe he's away. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's muted. muted at least. I did ask some questions. If you want announcements, let us know, Kratonian. If not... Oh. Ah, I, um, multitasking. Uh, I understand. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Okay, Take your uh, time. So, what I would think is that um, it would be.
be cleaner to have one jail for the base image, which is a j persistent jail which runs new processes. Mm -hmm. It only exists to bring itself in its file system into fruition so that you have this file system and then you do things with that in another jail. Mm -hmm. In the hooks which run on the host, like mm -hmm. pre-start uh, or prepare if you want it to be clean. Um, for example, you could do a nullfs mount or you mm -hmm. could um, do a ZFS snapshot and clone. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm from, doing. From the I... jailer file itself? Yes. Yeah, no, probably not. And here's why. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm totally okay with adding it as a feature, but not in this jailer file. Um, so the idea of the jailer file, for me at least, is this is a clear separation between operator and developer. Like the jailer file should be written by the developer, right? The developer know. knows. Yeah. Uh, I might have something like... A lib exec like mechanism. Lib exec like, and... yeah, of course. And the other is that it's the script will be called and it is part of the jail configuration directory of the base, not of the jail using it. The base of the jail. Okay. Okay. So your template would include a, a script to execute to do something. Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. you would source a script if you do the sourcing approach. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I do all of that uh, right now in just jail.conf. Mm -hmm. show it. So it all it can show it to you if you want. Yes, I'm gonna stop sharing. Let's have yep, a look. So at that. let me find the right window. Yeah. And we Michael, it to uh, Michael, any thoughts on your side for this? Uh, uh, we're a bit in the weeds. I hope he's got you in the right direction. Um, yeah, I, obviously, I like Jan's ideas very much. Very yeah. Uh, and like it, now that I'm comparing it with other. I want to say solutions right out there. Uh, I think this approach is much cleaner, uh, even for a newcomer, compared to what the Docker solutions are, or even what the uh, other FreeBSD GL management solutions are. And uh, uh, most FreeBSD solutions don't have a clear separator between developer and operator. Like right. inside of, I think it was Bastille file or something, you can uh do port forwarding i'm like no i i don't want port forwarding to be in a file that a developer writes right uh, developers and comments of how bastille is allowing the vm or the guest to do too many operational things so yeah 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 i yeah i don't like like developers and operators they've been not very close with each other for very sane reasons developers don't know networking uh, right. Operators don't know build processes, so like the it's, it's diagrams really... are pretty brutal. Exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> quick point of order: Don't disparage Docker in front of Doug, who's working difficult, you know, working hard to uh, get Docker and OCI working. <laughs> no, no, I mean, <laughs> I no, I, and, and that, 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 let's, yeah, just, yeah. No, seriously, point yeah. of order: Don't beat up on things while the people. Of course, of course. You know, create, of course. Know, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it is going to be in my uh, next steps to have like an OCI image converted to a tarball yes, that can okay. be deployed with Jailer because the, the ecosystem so, um, is there, you know? Let's all try not to I mean, crap on other technologies despite our hearts yep. wanting to do that. Oh, that's my point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Go ahead, Jan. There's a time for ranting and productive calls are normally... Not for right time for that. So um, <laughs> my min. So yep, here yep. I have like that stuff, and I use jail.conf with includes. You actually hard coded the GID. Yes, uh, for testing purposes to see how well it works, and um. I hard coded a one outside of the default allocation range. Well, that's why it's one million and one. Uh, the kernel will only ever auto allocate the first million gel IDs. So if you manually assign one over that, you will never clash with the auto allocator unless someone changes a kernel header.
So, but now if you see what I did, um, suddenly I have, um, let's, ma let's make it pretty. Um, so uh, suddenly I have a base system. Mm -hmm. the uh, the template and then the actual instantiation of that template mm -hmm. all of that via this pretty declarative configuration i would say mm -hmm. so get me the default things like the name of the pool mm -hmm. uh, hooks is just so that i have helper functions to make it pretty mm -hmm. Uh, FS tab uh, mm -hmm. does things like auto unmount stale mounts. Can you show me that uh, if I'm if you may? Here. Just want to have it in the recording so I can dig it a bit later. FS tab. Here, FS, -tab. Um, FS tab is this, so it it includes its defaults, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the important part is the uh, um, prepare. Yep. Uh, which holds this. Mm -hmm. And but that is generated which I said oh yeah, it's a multi-line exit. Okay, so I mm -hmm. wrote it as mm -hmm. so this here inside is the shell code and it's double quoted. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here Ah, yeah, this is what yeah. I needed, yes. Nice. So what I'm doing is, um, so um, the more important part probably for you is this one. Mm -hmm. uh, which then in unmount.sh, So it's a previous DSH shell, but that's yeah. Vim normally only highlights bin SH as uh, POSIX. So here what I do is I use mount dash P with an empty uh, FS mm -hmm. tab, mm -hmm. which looks something let's just filter that for um Mm -hmm. It looks mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's basically just the currently mounted file systems. But unlike normally, if you give mount to dash p flag, it for prints out uh, the mounted file systems in FS tab format, mm -hmm. which is easy to pass with just shell built ins. Uh, arc would be simpler, but would spawn off an arc process, whereas doing it with built ins, given the kilobyte or so of text, I expect it's faster to just do it in shell buildings than fork a new process. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's a bit of an ugly optimization, but hey. And then I have the verbose variable is set, so I could do something like that. So jail dash r um, Does it have to be a string? No, it just has I'd to say. be a non empty. Okay. And now we get more verbose output from a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yes, I was debugging that. <laughs> But I fixed it, so I should just get rid of that. So, 
But let's do something. Let's say I have mount dash t tempfs tempfs. Um, We're a bit down a rabbit hole. Do you want to do to want to meet after the call? Yeah, we can stop the recording. Well, okay. I'd, I do have other topics on the agenda. <laughs> oh, Montenegro will be right yes. back. Um, yeah. So finish up that. He stepped away according to the chat. Yep. Well, let's give him a moment. Thank you, dear patient. Okay, uh, so let's just switch over to yourself. Take okay. the screen and. Uh, thank you. We'll give him just... a moment to get back, and I will just touch on some topics, and you are both absolutely welcome to. Uh... Maybe Quetonian has something to add as well. Yes. Listening and nothing. Yes, and hopefully so, we'll solve all of the world's problems on item potence and other fun. Okay, what is your uh, part? So, uh, waiting on Antrenig, I wanted to see if he has any just future comments. Uh, yes, I do all three calls. And uh, Cretonian, I need an email address for that. Drop it into chat or mail me one. Thank you. So, I don't or know. just if, DM. I don't know if. Uh, Antoinette wants to mention anything new about the net graph retry issue he found, but fortunately he found at least a workaround. So Antoinette, are you back? And then uh, Daniel had some points about IPv6. Uh, there was back, a... sorry. Welcome back. Antoinette, do you have anything so, um... about the net graph retry issue? Oh, yeah. I yes, didn't yes, see yes. any other calls and the links are there, but hey, is there anything new on that? You had a workaround that's better than no workaround. Uh, yeah, I do have a workaround which uh, Mr. Rod said it's wrong. Well, the high value might be wrong. You could just start yeah. small. But yeah, but what I got was the following. Uh, let's see. Uh, net dot link dot if q max len q as in the letter q. Uh, I, I changed that to a uh, to four thousand ninety six. Yes, but the default was fifteen, and then all of the retry issues that we had from last week or two weeks ago—I don't remember—it yeah, yeah, just yeah. all went away and just like we're, I'm, I'm getting pure ten gigabit between two jails over oh, VNet, nice. over NetGraph. So like it's really nice. Obviously, you can get like sixty gigabit on Michael's uh, dealing machine if you're doing it, alias networking. But uh, having VNet and 10 gigabit was very nice to have. And uh, yeah, um, I think you pasted something. I pasted probably something huge. I was trying to put in just that uh, one little item copy. OK. Yeah. So um, that's, that's my point, which is, you know, um, uh, I don't know Rod's, I mean, I don't know if it's OK to modify this or not. Modifying uh, is fine. It's tunable, in, so it's fine. Love. It's just annoying that you have to reboot. Yes. Yes. So. Yes. Um, and as, I mean, apparently both drivers as well as firmware can modify the if QLAN max, if Q max LAN, if they want to. And in case of um, in case of e pair, it is set to four thousand ninety six. Just by the way. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, other firmware, especially more complex ones, like from Melanox, et cetera, they might do their own thing. Yeah. But um, yeah, a long story short, uh, it worked fine. I'm very happy with it in my setup. Like I have no complaints. I've been running it on um, home production, not public production okay. for a while. And uh, uh, very good speeds. Can't, can't complain at all. Yeah. Okay. That's for sure. Uh, just point of order, Daniel had this answer uh, yes. for using IPv6. Uh, so take a look. It's regarding uh, pop, 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 RTSLD, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let me make a note here in chat. Yeah, basically, if you're restarting your, your routing, uh, like you're doing service routing restart, which would you know restart the routing tables, etc. Sometimes it takes a while, but if you do NDP dash R, which flushes only the default routing tables, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes much faster. 
I didn't know that. So I was removing all of the entries <laughs> with like dash DA, which is delete all. Uh, but the dash R is only for default routing tables, which is very good to know. Uh, is it default routing? Yeah, it's the default routing. Let me see, man, NDP dash R, a flush the entries in the default router list. Yes. Got it. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, very good. Thank you, Clara. And I think we will be upstreaming that and to make it part of the routing script itself, basically. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's what a, else was from there? Monday? There's a nice article on VXLAN over WireGuard. Yes, yes. Um, just going proprietary stuff. Just yeah. a short uh, note. The problem with the setup is that unless I overlooked something, it's uh, only point-to-point -point configuration. Yes, that is but correct. That that but there is a workaround which scales up to, let's say, a few dozen or so systems reasonably well. Okay, yes. you tell. Because FreeBSD does not have uh, um, full support in any of the ported routing demons to do uh, BGP-based signaling or uh, VXLAN. Oh, interesting. Which is what the Cisco does. cool kids do yeah uh, what but what you can do is the freebsd bridge driver um has a feature which is definitely not intended for that use case but works for that use case uh, and that's the following so you uh, create one point two point vx land tunnel per um server in your cluster. Uh, overlay network, cluster, whatever. Um, and if you add them all to a, a, the same bridge and disable spanning tree on the bridge, yep. obviously that would normally immediately produce routing loops. Or you disable at least spanning tree on all the um, VXLAN member ports of the bridge. So normally as soon as you have two servers, you would have an immediate switching loop and everything would collapse. But if you tag the um, bridge ports as, um, let me set, check for the exact syntax, um, as uh, private, then, uh, and do it before you bring up the VXLAN interfaces or the bridge as a whole, or you enable a spanning tree and then Add the interface on a spanning tree enabled bridge, set the port to private, and then set the port to no uh, spanning tree on that port. Then it all works. And the trick is that any port uh, received on a private bridge port will never be flooded to another private port. So as long as you have a full mesh of uh, the XLAN tunnels, it feels like a working Ethernet with just flooding as fallback. Yeah, because like and... in, in, in other, in the cool kids VXLAN, you can have a VXLAN zero, which mm -hmm. is not just from one end to other end, but it could be from one end to multiple other ends. Am I right? You can do the same on FreeBSD if your underlay is multicast capable. If your underlay is multicast. Oh, I see what you mean. The problem is that some implementations of BSD only support point-to-point uh, -point and flooding and not multicasting. Yeah, yeah. And learning. So because the problem is that a single VXLAN interface is kind of like in that configuration is kind of like a port on a distributed switch. So what you're doing with bridge in the XLAN is basically you have your internal bridge connected via one port to your distributed switch and all yeah. your VXLAN interfaces together form your distributed switch. And now you have to kind of maintain the uh, the forwarding database of that distributed mm -hmm. switch, which maps um, 
MAC destination MAC addresses to a tunnel endpoint, so IP address and port. Mm -hmm. I think and by the way, I that think, I can think... be done via BGP based signaling or via multicast based learning, which does not scale well and is not how you're supposed to do it in production and um, requires that you have an underlay with yeah. multicast capabilities, which you won't find on any hoster. But the hack I described has the advantage that while it it's it's even something which some of the BGP controlled ones do, it's called source-based uh, replication, where basically uh, multicast and broadcast packets are replicated by the VLAN, uh, the XLAN tab. So tunnel endpoint. So but you do a kind of or sometimes you do the same on Wi-Fi where you do a multicast to unicast conversion. Mm -hmm. And it works reasonably well for things with which are either low bandwidth or low fan out, or hopefully both. I see. And in in mm. in Illumos, uh, in Illumos, uh, they call this an overlay pipe in DLADM, by the way. And mm -hmm. uh, they don't. I I think they don't support broadcast and multicast, but instead they have a daemon called VARPD. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, parses a config file and mm -hmm. can uh, proxy things as needed, basically. From, so, from um, one end to other end. You could, and I've considered doing that with MQTT. Mm -hmm. They, as a backend, the FreeBSD bridge driver has the f option. I have to look up the syntax, and uh, I've got um, bridge. Um, you can um, set a port as the, what's it called? I mean, not learn the, let's pan. Let me check. Oh, you yeah, can set an interface which receives, basically set it up in such a way that only one tab interface you add mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would receive all the, um, um, so you would remove the discover flag from all other interfaces. Mm -hmm. Uh, except for the tab interface you put on the bridge, then mm -hmm. all of the uh, unknown um, destination MAC addresses would just go to that. It mm -hmm. is a tab interface, so a user space daemon could then consume those Ethernet frames and look them up to uh, in some other source of truth to find them. And you could then have some kind of little helper daemon which would use a uh, trio of MQTT brokers to for each VLAN overlay, uh, sorry, VXLAN overlay, the or just store there the MAC address to endpoint mapping, and you would install that on demand. Okay. You could do that. To, mm, I'll I'll try I'll also try doing a VXLAN between FreeBSD and um, OmniOS just to see how mm -hmm. that works. That would be very interesting. To just have. work out of the box. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I mean, it would be also cool to have like a jail and a zone in the same subnet. In this case, of course, uh, that that would also be very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Jail and. Uh... Yeah, like you know, on OmniOS it would be a zone. On FreeBSD side it would be a jail, and uh, both what? of them are in the same subnet and the same uh, layer two, virtual layer two in this case, I guess. So yeah, Jan, if if um if I have a host based lab like a host with a lot of jails on it, and I have a host with a lot a lot of jails on like another host with a lot of jails, then. Mm -hmm. Um, I create the VXLAN tunnels and then I add the VXLAN tunnel into the bridge that the jails are sitting on. And I guess that would be the whole process, right? Um, that would be the inefficient common way to do that exactly. on real hardware. Uh, 
for the special case of FreeBSD on uh, as a host on both sides, it mm -hmm. would be, in my opinion, a lot more sensible to use instead um, a, just a routing table and okay. do normal IP routing. Okay. And have a yeah, have a, something like an IPsec VTI interface. Um, and don't do any layer two. You don't need the layer two if you do alias. Now that I understand, yes. but I mean, like, like um, on VNet, uh, St yes. A Stefano's case was very interesting. Do you know why? Because okay. they were migrating services, right, from one mm -hmm. VPS to another. I don't know if it's in the yeah. blog, though. I was talking with them. Yeah, well, um, and since you don't want to change the configuration, right, uh, from mm -hmm. either of the sides, you can just use a VXLAN, so it would mm -hmm. still be the same IP while it's on a different machine. Yep. Right? That's a perfect case for VXLAN. Uh, so yes, what I'm thinking, yeah. Extending the layer two so that all yeah. things stays the same. Yeah. Yes, but if you're doing that as your real overlay network for your, as not oh, as no, a of course not. no, of course not. Failover. No, of course not. No, I, I, I try to stay and away from VX. WireGuard is perfect for yeah. the, keep it simple. Uh, exactly. Stuff for point to point behavior, but if you need anything more complex, then it's also WireGuard is not the best uh, VPN protocol for that use case. Yeah. I know heresy to say, um, but, IPsec. Um, mm. correct IPsec, and the important part is IPsec in transport mode, so that you have one less level of headers, because what you send over the wire in the configuration they describe is, um, I can say that so clearly because I've tried it, is you do the following, you send an ethernet frame, inside is IP, then UDP, then the WireGuard header, then inside the WireGuard as payload, you have mm -hmm. the, an IP and then an, on, over a UDP, then the XLAN, and then an other Ethernet. Yeah, but the, the, the problem- At that point, the header chain is so disgustingly long. Yeah. Instead, what you could do is you just do Ethernet IP from underlay, IPsec transport mode, VXLAN, Ethernet. Yeah, my 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 problem currently, at least, mm -hmm. with IP with using IPsec is that the setup is like, or rather the opposite. Like with with WireGuard, are just like you know, it's an any file format. You type it, you do service start, you're done, right? In case yep. of IPsec, the setup process is not as simple. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're uh, if, right. if you have a if, if you have a template though, if like if you can point me to something like that, it, it would make my life easier. Template. Yeah, it would make my life much easier. It's I would like love to twenty lines like of IPsec con for strong spawn, <laughs> and it supports uh, for using FreeBSD IPsec interfaces with your routing friendly point to point layer three interfaces. And yeah, I I can't do. Your IPsec without strong swan if I'm also behind the net, right? Or if I'm doing roaming, let's say on a laptop. Uh, roaming is exactly why I wanted to use IPsec mm -hmm. with strong swan mm -hmm. because um, maybe, uh, Michael, do you have anything else that should well, come to the uh, record? Good, 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 good eye, good eye. Um, so I am curious to what is the state of IPsec in base in FreeBSD without strong swan. Without strong swan, you can do uh, basic IPsec between two public endpoints. Okay. Uh, very yeah, easy. Strong um, swan add. I haven't heard that name in 20 years, but yeah. It's still around. It's still <laughs> the right. least bad unless you consider OpenBSD IPD, uh, yeah. which is doesn't do everything. What it does is great, and we finally have an up to reasonably up to date port because they uh, started doing a portable version of that. Yeah. But... So what does it add? So from, you know, you've got base, what does strong swan add? Yeah. What does no. it add to the process, to the whole system? Uh, the key exchange. Ah, okay. What we have in base is the data plane, basically. Moving packets once you have session keys. Um, 
Strong Tron uh, establishes the session key and potentially loads the policies because you don't want to use uh, reuse your uh, session keys. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have a you for each time you establish a session, you have to have your unique session key. Otherwise, you have no forward security. And in some cipher modes, no security the moment you uh, reboot. Because when you do something like CBC, so cipher block chaining, and we use the key and the initialization vector, uh, so it's to source and you have plain text. Um, don't do that. Um, well known since there is open source uh, or just academic literature on modern-ish uh, ciphers. So it's, but you need something which sets up the loads the policy database and then the kernel is intended to uh, request via PF key version two from its helper daemon hey, I have a packet which, according to the policy, should be IPsec processed, but I don't have a session key. And then something like StrongSwan, Raccoon, if you want to be mm -hmm. even more ancient, or ICD, responds to that and um, establishes the session key or fails. If it fails, okay, the packet gets dropped. If it succeeds, uh, traffic can flow and everything is fine. Mm. Um, but before we go down that rabbit hole, we should probably kill the recording because I don't want to share some of the warts in that config. Oh, just drop that private config there. So yeah. uh, late last night, I think I have revisited a the G part bug that you should, previously was resulting in a panic, but still is a bit mm -hmm. wonky. I'm splatting down VM images and then doing a G part backup, and I do not get the same results I get like these numbers i'll make it red i then on the sure. exact copy backup get these numbers and then i get free space at the end despite the fact that they're supposed to be identical so yeah uh that uh kind of rains on my parade for what i'm doing but i guess i'll just keep at it and we can't have nice things yet entirely so i previously that restore would cause a panic now it does this um and i just tried it during the call with two hardware devices and yes it's off by seven blocks despite g part restore hopefully just taking a faithful entire partition table to a blank device yeah this even same model number can have a depending on how good the this came out of a factory can have a few blocks of difference true between but them. i'd hope my uh truncate dash s 10 gig images which are right here are identical so here they are i did a, a I, I listed them so they are identical mm. and it's two models of the same one who do show up as the same so no it's not the disk misbehaving it is still and, and the, the last time i visited that it was like oh yep hopefully someone will fix gpt again and i guess i'm now seeing that so yeah that's the fun of having one's nose deep in these things uh very very briefly i had a a, I have a poll running on the Fediverse of like, hey, looking at VM images, which is what I'm doing, what is the correct thing that a, say, an operating system project like FreeBSD or Cough OpenBSD would be nice to have VM images? Uh, what should they do in their VM images? Should they have no default password, which has been traditionally kind of common, but probably violates California and EU rules on, say, routers having no default passwords? Um, should they have a default password, which I think is a lovely false sense of security and I always forget them, or should there be a super fancy thing like cloud in it? Uh, the poll is still um, running, so you're welcome to vote in the poll, but- I, So I in my opinion, a good compromise, default. Yes, which is probably not among your poll options, if those are the poll sure. options, my place, yeah. would be to have uh, uh, just put a tab or whatever, um, in FreeBSD, it would be a good idea to have a little partition, just one megabyte, yep. with a TFS. And there you put your initial configuration stuff. Um, and you would just copy that, or you just, just unpack that tarball on first boot or something. Mm -hmm. um, we 
I've already decided to do the slightly more fancy one in 14.1 with nudge, uh, what's it, nudge in it or something. Uh, yeah, this rc.d script, if you use it, um, is a partial okay. minimal uh, oh, cloud in it compatible system. Ah, yes, correct. And yep. you can just use that to do the initial config. Well, pointing to what? Pointing to a tarball, an attached device? To, to oh. a, um, to a div partition. Mm. And then you document for real production users as to how to uh, generate with a shell script uh, or whatever, or some command which would be installed from a port or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter how to generate that config payload to individualize uh, it at the partition level. So you, re it comes with just enough space for an empty partition. And yeah. because if you run the root file system to be growable, which makes total sense on a virtual machine, it has to be the yeah. last. So you have to have that partition on your partition table and the megabyte is plenty. So uh, it's not like it hurts you to have that space preserved. You could even fit it in the uh, alignment rounding from the boot blocks by just not leaving the alignment free, but allocating the free space in the alignment, the few hundred kilobytes to a um, FAT16 file system or something. And yeah. What about the crap, UEFI partition? Um, no, please don't. Um, yeah, exactly. First of all, it's UEFI specific. Uh, so what do you do on systems yep. which boot without UEFI? And second, it doesn't belong there. Um, it's for so, the UEFI boot code, not for other things. Adding uh, a partition would sure mess up all the established partition naming and numbering, etc. And of course, if it's numbering, time to be run for a few yes seconds, no. sit around forever, mm -hmm. but your partitions yep. do not have to be in order. So there is some free space, I think. So, oh, but not much. Uh, I assumed they had a one megabyte alignment. This but is then... the uh, the release engineering produced make release make FS image, which mm -hmm. may not have correct alignment. Okay, so if, yeah, but if you, have that partition in your VM images. First of all, you should not be using the the partition index in your FS tab anymore, please. Especially not in this. virtual machines. Device Correct. numbers and so on can so easily change. Oh yes, but also you can if you bring in another uh, pool, etc. You'll have conflicting GPT IDs and labels, so it's like a whole different issue. I know. And but, I just made it like boot 100 or root FS 100, just so it will not conflict. Because yes, you could easily create- yeah, Of course it will conflict. It will conflict like, with uh, itself. And then it adds in a number and it's like, oh, come on. A lot the of- The moment someone things. combines two di disks from running your scripts twice, you have reproduced to a problem. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, so I'm just- Joking aside. These, uh, limits here. But anyway, go ahead, yes. If you do it like that, it could even be a partition reserved for holding only the root SSH key. Mm -hmm. Reading yes. it directly from a special partition type. And then the project would simply ship an empty directory and say, hey, put your key here. Um, yes. Or have free space for you to put that in in the script to use that free space. Just set the alignment higher so that you have or create and delete a partition, I don't care. Um, just yep. leave some space uh, before the beginning of your root file system for there to be that place to hold it. And uh, because partition for uh, table formats are cross operating system, and if you do write it to a raw partition as a U star file. U star? What? <laughs> US tar, basically minimal tar. 
The right. portable subset among all POSIX like TARS. Okay. Uh, TAR without GNU or BSD or Shili or whatever extensions. Yep, yep, yep. The, the, the portable subset which anything POSIX compliant has to be able to work with. Well, I'd argue you, the root partition has space, just mount it and mangle it. Uh, yeah, but the yeah. problem is that yeah. that expects the one deploying it to be able to read and write the file system. Uh, yes. What and if you have a Windows or Linux machine without ZFS support and want to use it to deploy a FreeBSD machine? Or have to use it. Right. To Actually, and that's the irony. FreeBSD is really good at hosting other file systems, but other file systems are really terrible at anything beyond native. So yes, that's that's indeed a... And uh, because of that, I would argue for using TAR, which in the case of FreeBSD can even be supported uh, via TARFS to directly mount yep. the partition. So um, you could do it like that. Uh, or you could do an ISO or a FAT file system and then uh, use the newer, new age init or whatever. Uh, I'm afraid that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, new age init. Oh, really? Oh, goodness. I don't know. I'm not sure, but... Okay. Uh, we, we'll ask Colin, I suppose. Yeah, ask uh, whoever wrote, uh, picked the name. Well, ISO is mighty uh, portable, but not very writable. <laughs> Unless you remaster it. Anyway, well, thank you. That's what? a no. It's easy. Oh ISO yeah. ISO uh, sorry. Uh, ISO ninety six. So the file system, not a full disk image. Oh, got it. Okay. Just, and that you can on FreeBSD, you can create that with tar. Just set the format to yes, ISO. Yes, you can. You can expand it. Um, huh? Awesome. Okay. Well, LibArchive will open it, which I will, so unrelated. I consider awesome. LibArchive can also write ISO yes. archives. Okay. Got it. So uh, an ISO is probably the, so an ISO 9660 partition is probably the easiest one because you can easily uh, find tools for different operating systems. TAR is even easier to write, but a bit harder to consume and would need a bit of custom tooling, whereas using an ISO file system uh, labeled as uh, config-2 or... Um, Whatever. Yeah. Why well, I don't know why that's the name it has to have, but that's it. That is. Cool. Uh, okay. Well, so you can either call it no cloud or config dash two, and then yep. uh, the RC.d script does its magic. Uh, do we know if new agent it is ISO friendly, or would it care? It so it only supports so look at the RC dot I'll take a peek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on a fourteen dot one system, it's not in fourteen zero. Okay. Um. So that would. Yeah. So cool. the the downside of using ISO is that most operating systems do not have an ISO generation tool, uh, which users are familiar with, easy to use and at All hand. Right. Yeah. The bloated ones do have it uh, pre-installed, but no, almost nobody knows about them. And something like Chili Tools, of course, it works, um, but uh, you have to install it and know how to use it. And mm, anyone, well, I would expect that most people who are who care about automatic deployment have. Um, passing familiarity with tar. You, uh, sh how is Shilly spelled? You mentioned that, and I remember I've seen a name like that, but uh, how is that spelled? Do you have a link for Shilly tools or whatever you said? Unless I'm mishearing you. Yep. yep. Ah. Uh, once, there we so, go. Uh, Robert oh, took goodness. over maintenance once uh, once they offered, uh, once you are passed. So uh, it's now available via Git inside of uh, SourceForge. Oh, good. Yeah, I don't get me wrong. I wish GitHub would buy SourceForge. Just please, just port it over. Did, I, that's not an endorsement of SourceForge. 
I mean, GitHub, but still, it's really oh shit. Yeah. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's uh, we have a port, so you don't have to read for source uh, here. You can just install the package. Cool. Mm. Okay. So you two want to deep dive, or aren't trying to give like electricity and networking yet, or are you still in the dark ages? And you're muted, but I will. He's muted, and uh, he will probably come back. Potential. Here. So, um, so Cratonian, there is a a taste of where these discussions can go. Sometimes they are hands on deep dives. Sometimes they're just reports. Sometimes they are brainstorming. Sometimes like it's done in thirty minutes. Yep. Not today. Um. Okay, Antoning, if you're muted, you can't yell like and subscribe. You know. Do, 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 do. Like and subscribe. <laughs>